Um, well, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Maureen scallon Failer, and I am the president here at the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. And we are also an affiliate uh, with the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce. And I'm real pleased and, and thrilled to see all of you here this morning on a beautiful Friday fall morning, nice and brisk. Um, but for you to come and, and take the time out this morning to come here about some really interesting information. Um, I want to acknowledge um, our sponsor for uh, this morning's program, Excel Energy. And, and Michelle, can you stand up and say hello to the group and welcome everyone? Hello group, welcome. <laughs> so, all right. Great, <laughs> poor Michelle, she's like, what I wanted to do. Um, but uh, Excel has been a long-standing member of the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce and Minneapolis Regional Chamber. Michelle also uh, serves on our board of directors. I think you're just coming up on your first year, finishing your first year, so we're very pleased to have you on. Um, and it's, it's, it must be fall because we have Excel putting on our energy program, and this has kind of become a mainstay with the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce that we have a program geared and focused on energy. And I've always found it very fascinating and interesting um, when we hold this program. I mean, Michelle's like, it's Friday morning, what are we gonna do? It's like, oh, trust me, Jim's gonna be great, he's gonna sing, he's gonna dance, and he's gonna throw some energy into the mix. But um, no, we really appreciate Excel's partnership and thank you again for, for your sponsorship. Um, there's lots of exciting things happening here at the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce, and I think I've seen a lot of you at least two or three times this week already. And so I, that makes me very happy. That makes me very happy because that tells us that you're getting something out of your membership with the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. So I want to thank each and every one of you. Well, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker here this morning. Jim Adlers has been with Excel Energy for 39 years. Jim, you're not that old. I started when I was three. Yes, okay, thank you. In the first half of his career, he was involved with conducting environmental reviews for new power plants, transmission lines, and other electric infrastructure. Jim worked with the Minnesota Environmental Agencies, land owner, owners, local authorities, and other stakeholders to obtain siting and routing <coughs> permits for new plants and lines. Jim was part of the team that routed the state's largest power line to Winnipeg, Canada, obtained permits for the state's largest po power plant complex in Becker, and obtained approvals for waste to energy plants. In the second half of Jim's career, how many careers are you going to have? Three, four? Okay. Okay. In the second half of his career, Jim has continued to interact with state regulators concerning major electric infrastructure, however, with a little different focus. Jim has been involved in the company's resource planning, which is the process for determining when new generation is needed and how best to meet that need. <coughs> Jim has also been involved in several energy policy debates, including the future of nuclear power in Minnesota, the conversion of coal plants in the Twin Cities to natural gas, the addition of wind and solar power to the power system, and conversion. Help me welcome Jim. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maureen. Good morning. Good morning. My task is to uh, give you a little flavor of what we foresee coming and the kinds of interesting energy policy issues are associated with providing electricity to our customers. Uh, I'll breeze through of several slides and hopefully that will create some questions and we can have a, a conversation about how we make electricity and what's to come. Whoops, I forgot to check out the channel changer here. Well, first, XL Energy. You hear, hear our company's name, a little bit about the company and who we serve. 
XL Energy is a holding company with four local retail public utilities. Uh, we serve about 75-80% of Colorado. Southwest Public Service Company serves the panhandle of uh, Texas. Uh, and we serve customers in five states across the upper Midwest here in Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Wisconsin, and just a little bit of the upper peninsula of Michigan. When you add all of that up, we serve about 3.4 million customers with electricity. Uh, and you can see some of uh, what we like to tell people about our company and our, uh, some of the great things that, that we've been able to do with our power supply. Uh, this four groups uh, of companies are the number one wind energy provider in the nation. We have the most wind energy on our system that any other utility has in the country. Uh, we're making significant additions of solar power to our systems. Uh, we have several customer choice green pricing programs so that customers can choose to add um, renewable energy and pay that premium for what it costs compared to the rest of the system to, again, advance some of the uh, interests that are there among our customers. Uh, and we've been a long-standing um, forerunner in the conservation of, of energy on our systems. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Well, here in the upper Midwest, here's a closer look at the areas that we serve, that's the gray on those maps. It's a fascinating story about how electricity developed back at the turn of the century. Uh, small little electric light companies uh, were put together by Billsby and other friends of Mr. Edison. And uh, over time, those merged and it became Northern States Power Company. Uh, and we serve about half of the electricity here in Minnesota that's consumed. Uh, it's the larger communities across the state. We serve Fargo and Grand Forks, Sioux Falls in South Dakota, Eau Claire, Menominee, and some rural parts of western Wisconsin up into Ashland, and there's that little corner of the Upper Peninsula. The green dots are our generation on that system. The blue is hydropower. That's where power got started here in the upper Midwest with dams along the Chippewa and other flowages in western Wisconsin. <clears throat> Small units, uh, about 200 megawatts in total over our system. Um, and we've refurbished those over the year and they still play a significant role in our power supply. Uh, back in the 20s and 30s, we added coal-fired power plants in the metro area, relatively small in scale by today's standards. Uh, but nonetheless, what was needed to serve customers here uh, in the Twin Cities. Uh, we added to those plants over time with larger units as uh, our communities grow. Uh, and Highbridge and Riverside, for example, were coal-fired power plants that were added to over time and were the workhorses of our system through the 50s and 60s. Power plants were then added uh, in the 70s up at Becker. We have a major coal complex in the late 60s, King out on the St. Croix. And in the 70s, nuclear power came. Uh, and we have two nuclear uh, power plant sites, one up by Monticello and the other down by Red Wing. And of course, we've added renewables over time in the, starting in about the 90s with significant additions of wind power in southwestern Minnesota. And we're, right now you don't see it because it's the relatively new um, addition to our system and that's solar power, which I'll talk a little bit about. All of these are connected by a network of transmission lines. And so you can't point to one power plant and say that serves the neighborhood here. They all operate as an orchestra. 
Uh, we orchestrate the output from all of these plants so that we're providing the most cost-effective energy we can depending on the demand for electricity. Let me state the obvious. You can't store electricity once it's produced, at least not economically at a utility scale yet. And so there's no inventory. And we have to produce the electricity instantaneously with the demand for electricity. And so we have to have enough power plant capacity available to meet the peak demand. And peak demand for this region is during the summer when everybody's got their air conditioning on, it's hot and muggy, and uh, a period like that lasts for three or four days and people relent and they turn their air conditioning on about the same time that peak industrial output is occurring. Uh, and so we get those peak demand periods and that system has to have enough production capacity to meet that circumstance. Well, here's a 2013 snapshot of the mix of generation that we have to serve our customers. We're about 36% coal, about a third nuclear, and then we're more and more adding various other types of resources to our system. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Diversity is important. Can you imagine if you relied solely on coal in today's market? I just saw an item the, uh, this morning where Minnesota Power, the utility to the north of us in Duluth, has to shut down a couple of smaller power plants because they can't get adequate coal uh, to those power plants because of congestion on the rail system. Uh, can you imagine? Uh, can you imagine relying solely on one of these types of resources and the cost of fuel associated with that resource goes through the roof and you have no options? Diversity is important in your power supply when it comes to the different types of fuel and resources to use to supply electricity. It's served the upper Midwest very well. We're fortunate to be kind of at the crossroads where we can economically use a number of different types of fuel to generate our electricity. Well, here's how that pie has changed over time and where we're headed. Uh, as you can imagine, in the past, we've relied more heavily on coal, the blue. Sorry, the background and the, the wording uh, don't show up very well, so I'll talk <laughs> you through that. The blue is coal on our system. Um, we're relying less and less on coal uh, for a couple of reasons that I'll talk about. Uh, Nuclear power that we've installed is kind of the workhorse of the system. It's very economical. A nuclear power plant produces at a constant output over time for two years at a time, and then you refuel. So it's a workhorse on our system, and uh, its output doesn't change very much. Uh, we're adding more and more renewable power. Wind is the purple square, so you can say there, there is a significant increase in the amount of of wind power on our system. Natural gas is increasing. It's the fossil fuel that's taking the place of coal in some respects. Uh, and it also is the fuel or the type of power plant that can compensate for the wind power and solar power ups and downs. You know, output from wind power only occurs when the wind blows. Output from solar power only occurs when the sun shines and, and varies up and down. So we've got to have other resources on our system to balance. And so th this is another orchestra on our system where all of these power plant types operate in concert. Here's another look at the same thing when you take a look at the, the carbon issue. CO2 emissions, climate change, Half of the resources on our system now are non-carbon emitting. Uh, and that's going to be a public policy issue that's going to be with us for a long time to come. And so I think there's a constant effort to try and find ways to improve uh, the environmental performance of the fleet that makes electricity. 
Here's another look at emissions. Actually, over time since 2005, we've reduced the amount of carbon emissions from our power plant fleet by 30%. We, I'll talk a little bit more about that. We've been an early adopter. We've tried to work with uh, our uh, regulators in, in dealing with public policy issues like emissions of carbon dioxide. Uh, but that's not the only motivator for that slide. We've also had aging <coughs> power plants that we needed to do something with. And we were able to refurbish them and modernize them while at the same time changing fuel to reduce the amount of CO2 coming from our plants. Similar story for other pollutants that are talked about. <coughs> Sulfur dioxide, mercury, um, and nitrogen oxides. <coughs> Well, what is resource planning? At the end of the day, what we're trying to do is provide our customers with reliable, affordable, and environmentally responsible electricity. In order to do that, we have to plan into the future. Resource planning is a long-range exercise. How long does it take to implement a new power plant? Well, for a gas-fired uh, power plant, relatively small in size, uh, you need two or three years to get through the regulatory processes associated with a new facility. You have to prove up the need for the facility since we're a regulated uh, public utility. You have to get permission uh, or get uh, <laughs> approvals for the, a selected site for a facility and do all the environmental work associated with that. And then it, it takes about three years to build major nuclear or a major baseload power plant addition to our system is probably more like seven to ten years. So the development cycle is long. These are very important public policy issues about what you're going to add. Uh, and so we need to work with all the stakeholders and it takes a while to, to figure out what you're going to do. Uh, so it's a long-range issue. We have to investigate all the alternatives. Can you avoid the increasing demand for electricity by working with customers to conserve? Um, what renewable alternatives ought to be considered if you're thinking about a fossil fuel plant? Those kinds of issues all have to be examined in that process. And then the way we figure out what the answers to those questions are is to do elaborate modeling where we add a virtual power plant to our system and we simulate how it will operate over its life and we try to identify what the cost differences are between that and some other alternative. We try to look at what the environmental performance characteristics are of the entire system with that power plant compared to the entire system with some other alternative. And through the examination of alternatives, we sort out cost differences and other pub public policy implications of the choices that have to be made. Out of that comes an action plan. <coughs> we tend to focus on what steps do we need to take over the next five years or so uh, so that whatever issues are associated with the supply of power uh, can be met and some of the questions that we have that don't need to be decided uh, we can gather more information about so we can make a better ju judgment three, four, five, ten years down the road. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the first drivers of course is what's the forecast of demand from our customers? Well, that's not an easy proposition. You know, anyone that knows statistics and probability and all of that, who knows exactly where, what, what this metropolitan area is going to look like 10 and 15 years from now. Remember, that's the horizon we got to look at when we're trying to figure out what to develop. And so it's no surprise that over the last several years, here's what we said the demand for electricity is going to look like back in 2007 when we were forecasting back then. Remember that was before the Great Recession here? All of a sudden, 
the recession happens, and when you run statistics, you got to work with the data you got, and so all of a sudden it looks like we're going to have significantly less power demand over time. And slowly, since the recession, and as the economy has come back, and as the data set that we're working with has changed, slowly um, the need for power has been projected to increase. Still not back to what we thought the economy was going to do back in the pre-recession point of time, but I guess the takeaway from a slide like this is it's darn hard to really know exactly what's going to happen 5, 10, and 15 years in the future, but that's the planning horizon we, we, we have to work with. Um, and that, therefore, there's a lot of uncertainty, and to the extent we can develop a strategy that gives us flexibility so that we can be light on our feet and respond as we learn more, that's a, another important characteristic of planning. Well, once you've got a forecast of some sort, then what do you, what do, you do? You, the blue bar is the forecast. On top of that is a reserve. And a reserve is in, in recognition of the characteristics of electricity. Okay? We've got a set of power plants to serve our customers. Um, what happens when one of them fails unexpectedly? You've got to have another power plant in the wings ready to supply power because we have the obligation to serve. And the only way to do that is to have <laughs> adequate capacity to serve you instantaneously. Okay. Now that reserve bar is relatively small because the, all of the utilities in the upper Midwest are interconnected with transmission lines. And there's arrangements worked out that will share power plant capacity in reserve so that no one utility has to provide all of their own reserves. And by doing that, uh, we can make our power supply more economical. Uh, when we share that backup resource, uh, no one utility has to have as much reserve as they would otherwise. But nonetheless, that's the bar we have to meet with our power, power plant planning. So then we stack up those generation resources against that, that need anticipated, and that tells us if we're short or long. Um, and when you look out, this is a, a look that was done back in 2011 or 12, and indeed we identified the, the potential need for uh, some relatively modest additions to our power plant system. And I'll talk a moment or two about what we're doing to fill that need. But that's the name of the game. Now, you know, you're relying on 15-year forecasts that rely on projections about what the, the economy looks like. There's lots of uncertainty here, and so you have to take these estimates of uh, resource needs with a grain of salt. You've got to recognize the uncertainty in them. And so timing isn't precise. Well, how do we fill that resource need? Here in Minnesota, uh, over time, a competitive power supply process has developed where it used to be that the public utility uh, was vertically integrated. Uh, it worked with its regulators to decide what to build and where, um, and that was it. it. It was a real monopoly. Uh, today that's changed a little bit. We have independent power suppliers who compete for the right to build a new power plant uh, and sell the power to the utility who in turn sells the power to its customers. And so we, the public utility, XL Energy, has to compete with other independent power suppliers to make sure that our customers get the most cost-effective uh, power plant addition to our system possible. So we've gone into a competitive acquisition process we work, we've provided our proposal for meeting those resource needs. Uh, we proposed adding a 
combustion turbine, a gas-fired facility at our Black Dog power plant here on the Minnesota River uh, because we're retiring coal at that site, so we want to reuse that site. Uh, some other uh, independents have uh, proposed uh, expansions of gas-fired facilities. Uh, Calpine uh, has a facility in Mankato. Uh, they have proposed expanding that. An outfit called Invenergy has a facility in Cannon Falls. They've, ex they've uh, proposed expanding that. And another generator has proposed uh, adding some solar power to our system as part of the resource need here. The Commission took a look at all of those and said, well, we think that we should add the solar power uh, in combination with uh, one or more of those gas-fired proposals. And why don't you, XL Energy, go back and negotiate some draft contracts, bring those back to us, the Commission, and once we look at those, we'll, we'll decide which gas facility to go with that, that solar uh, proposal uh, to meet that resource need I showed you in the previous slide. So we're going through that process, and I think here by the end of the year we'll be done. And those power plants, fairly small in size, 100 megawatts, 200 megawatts, fairly small by utility standards anyway. Uh, <clears throat> will be added to our system in time to meet a 2018 or 19 uh, resource, anticipated resource need. However, it does look as we get new information about forecasts, etc., that the timing of that power plant may shift some. Uh, we think we might be able to shift it out in time. And why do you think that might be an important issue? Well, I'll answer the question. Um, Whenever you add even a modest-sized power plant to the system, there's a significant cost to customers. Um, the revenue requirements, uh, the amount of money we have to collect through rates increases by 20 or $30 million a year as a result of adding just a small resource like this. And our rates have been in the news over the last several years. We've experienced a lot of costs uh, that we've had to pass on to our customers. So we're looking very hard at how we can hold off or at least keep down the trajectory of rate increases for our customers. So if we can put off a, a power plant for a year or two or more, uh, that's only to the benefit of our customers. However, <laughs> we've got to make sure that the system's reliable. Well, that's the short term, and if we take care of that issue, um, that should take care of maintaining the reliability of our system for the next, oh, 10 years or so. And so really the, the, the issues on our system start to shift to what, what's going to happen out in the mid-20s. Um, this graph shows our power supply. Uh, and then it shows it dropping off pretty drastically in the mid to late 20s. And what that reflects, I'll talk a little bit more about, but we have major contracts with Manitoba Hydro for power from their system that are expiring. Uh, our nuclear power plants, their licenses to operate are expiring. Um, we have major environmental regulations coming down the pike that could affect the future of Sherco 1 and 2, our largest coal units remaining on the system. And so if all of that occurs, then we're going to have to do something to either replace them, extend those contracts, extend the future of nuclear power if that's the thing to do. Uh, those are the kinds of questions that face us now in resource planning. Let's go to the nu nuclear power question. Prairie Island and Monticello, 30% of the electricity you use. Um, very cost effective, run at full capacity night and day for two years at a time. Um, we've extended their licenses. We got permission to add dry storage for spent nuclear fuel on the power plant site because 
federal government didn't come to pick it up the way they promised they would. Um, we've got licenses to operate them beyond their original 40 years, so by 2030 these plants will be operating for 60 years. Will they be able to extend their licenses again? I don't think anybody knows for sure right now. It'll depend on how they operate over the next 20 years. Uh, and, and so there's a real question about what's the future of those plants after 2030. And again, I said the development cycle for a major power plant is seven, eight years. For nuclear power, of course, it's more like 10. Um, and so here, in the not too distant future, we're going to have to start refining our planning around what role nuclear power is likely to have on our system. It's emission free, climate change, CO2 emissions, not, not there with nuclear power, so it's very attractive from that perspective. Um, but what kind of costs will be associated with it? Can the existing power plants continue to operate? What would be the cost of a new power plant? Lots of questions that are going to have to be refined and thought about carefully and then debated and talked about in the public policy arena in order to pick out what our future is really going to be with nuclear power beyond where we are between now and 2030. Wind energy. We've developed a lot of wind power over the last 20 years. Oh, more like 15. Um, we have something like 1,800 megawatts of wind power on our system. That's probably, what, 3,000 machines. Each of these wind turbines serves, uh, produces about two, two and a half megawatts of power, at least the utility scale wind turbines do. Um, we have a mandate in Minnesota that 25% of the electricity you consume has to come from wind power. Uh, that was part of the debate over whether or not nuclear power should continue in Minnesota back in the 90s. Some standards were, were created for XL Energy as part of the grand bargain to allow nuclear power to continue. That morphed into actual standards for all utilities across the state. Uh, we're well on our way to meeting that standard. We currently have about 13% of the electricity you use coming from wind power. We're going to be adding 750 megawatts of additional wind power on our system between now and 2016. Um, going forward, the, there's going to be questions about, do you, do you need to do more? And the answer is yes, to meet the standards, we got to add some additional wind power perhaps something like 800 megawatts uh, in the foreseeable future here over the next <laughs> five or ten years. Um, and how wise is it to do that? Uh, what will it cost? Um, that 750 megawatts that we're adding between now and 2016, it turns out, has been very cost effective. Um, the cost of energy from those facilities is projected to be less than the cost of the alternative of building and operating a gas-fired power plant uh, as we go out in time over the next 20 years. Uh, and so if that's the case, which depends on what your prediction of the cost of natural gas is, but if that's the case, additional wind power could be a very attractive way to keep customer rates low, or lower than they otherwise would have been. Uh, but that also depends on the incentives associated with producing power. Right now, about a third of the cost of a <coughs> wind power plant um, is paid for by your federal taxes. Uh, federal government gives a $20, $25 uh, incentive over 10 years uh, for each megawatt hour of energy produced at a wind uh, turbine. And so there's a big incentive built into our federal tax system uh, for wind. If that's not there, the price of wind could go up 
substantially. And as the result, it's not clear whether it's still an economic choice. So that's another set of circumstances that we're going to have to watch closely as we plan the future for wind. Uh, are federal incentives going to continue? They're probably going to change because the industry has got its feet on the ground. It, it's a booming industry. Price of the technology is going down. Uh, utilities have experience with it. There may be less need for incentives, but nonetheless, the economics could change drastically, and then we'd have to take a hard look at whether or not it makes sense to add additional wind power to our system. And of course, we've got to do that in concert with our regulators, because we're not the only game in town, and these are big public policy questions to wrestle with. But we're actually, over time, going to reduce the cost of electricity compared to the alternative with the addition of the wind power, most recently, that's coming to our system. Solar. Lots of news around solar these days. The cost of solar power has declined, at least the technology. There's significant incentives at the federal and state level to help the industry get on its feet. Uh, and to see where it might go in the future. Uh, solar power has several dimensions. You can add rooftop solar. Our customers can add solar pho photovoltaic systems to their house if they've got a good orientation, or customers, uh, commercial and industrial customers can add facilities to their systems and they can self-generate. Uh, and we have programs in place to work with customers to um, support the development for those that are interested in doing that. If you don't have a situation where you can do that, um, a concept of community solar gardens is developing, where a developer identifies a site in a community, goes out and gets people to subscribe to his facility, and then the utility gives credits to customers that are subscribing to that facility to help pay and reflect the difference in cost. Um, it's kind of an alternative to putting panels on your own house if you don't have that, that kind of system available to you. Uh, and then there's utility scale, um, where a utility works with a developer uh, to build a much larger facility on a dedicated site. Uh, for example, we have the, um, uh, about a, what Paul, what's St. John's, two megawatts? Well, St. John's is 500 kW. 500 kW, we've got a, another facility out in Slayton that's two megawatts in size. Um, relatively small by utility scale standards, but nonetheless significant additions to our system for of solar. Um, but nonetheless, due to utility or economies of scale, uh, we anticipate the cost of adding solar at the utility scale will be the most economic solar power addition to our system. So what we've done is we've said, if you, you take a look at these three ways of developing solar power, uh, let's see how much customer interest there is in rooftops and solar gardens, and then let's produce about a third of or two-thirds of what we anticipate we'll need from solar power uh, through utility scale stuff. And we're just now working through a request for a proposal for someplace around 100 megawatts of solar power at the utility scale. And indeed, the pricing is very competitive. Uh, and, uh, and there's a lot of developers that are interested in providing that kind of facility to us. We expect that there'll be somewhere around two or 300 megawatts of solar power added to our system. That's what's needed to meet the uh, legislative mandate that was established a year or two ago. Like wind power, uh, the legislature has established a standard or a target for how much solar power to add to our system uh, and one and a half percent of the electricity you consume 
has to come from solar power uh, by 2020. And so we're headed toward that goal as a way to support the industry, get it off its feet, uh, and diversify that power supply in another way that I talked about earlier. So we'll be working through that. Hydropower. You saw the blue dots on the first map. That's that 200 megawatts or so of hydropower we have here in the Minnesota, Wisconsin area. Uh, most of our hydropower comes from a contract with Manitoba, where we buy about 800 megawatts of power from them. Uh, they have a 6,000 megawatt system of hydropower plants that goes all the way from Lake of the Woods through Winnipeg and up to the Hudson Bay. Uh, we tap that resource with major transmission lines, that 500 kV line that was in my bio was one of the first things I did to link the Twin Cities to the Iron Range in northern Minnesota and then up to Winnipeg. Manitoba then has power lines that go another 500 miles to Hudson Bay. Uh, so they have a huge set of infrastructure, lots of capacity for additional hydro <laughs> development in the far northern reaches of Manitoba. Uh, and we've enjoyed uh, con contracts with Manitoba Hydro uh, since the 70s. Uh, those contracts uh, periodically expire because uh, you don't want to put too many eggs in one basket for too long. Uh, and the next time they re expire is 2025. So that's again one of those big issues. Can we extend contracts with Manitoba Hydro for a piece of our power supply? Uh, their first choice is to serve their customers. Um, and so they will use their most economic hydro resources to serve their customers. And so the future cost of additional hydropower will probably depend on the cost of developing new high infrastructure on the Nelson and Churchill River in northern Manitoba. And that will determine what the cost of electricity sales to, to uh, U.S. customers like Excel Energy might be. And we'll have to figure out how that compares in cost to the alternatives available at the time uh, and see if there's a way indeed we can keep our power supply as green as it is with that amount of, of hydropower or some other alternative. Well, then there's coal. Coal used to be the backbone of the power supply system. If you'll recall some of those original slides, we had power plants here in the metro area, our major power plant in Becker, the King facility out on the St. Croix River, smaller plants in Mankato and Winona and La Crosse and Red Wing across the system. And so we were in the 50 or 60 percent coal power back in the 60s and 70s. Those plants, because they were developed starting in the 30s and were added to in the 50s and 60s, were old. And they needed many major refurbishment. And so back in the 1990s, we took a hard look at High Bridge over in St. Paul, Riverside up in northeast Minneapolis, and we said, what should we do with these plants? Um, they can't continue to operate. There's a lot of mech mechanical systems that somebody has to go out into the plant and throw a, a switch uh, to make these things work. Uh, uh, we need to modernize them uh, or we need to replace them. <coughs> and of course, uh, the whole issue of emissions and climate change and CO2 uh, was starting to develop at the same time. Uh, we took a look at what the economics of converting them to gas was, compared that to what the cost of the coal-fired operation would be after refurbishment, took a look at what the cost of uh, future pollution control might be 
at those coal-fired power plants if we were to extend their operation. Took a look at public policy directions headed our way, and we concluded the best thing to do for our customers would be to convert those two units um, to natural gas. And so that's what we did. Metro Emissions Reduction Program. Um, took a look at King and Riverside and converted them to natural gas. Turns out that that was a pretty good decision, uh, especially with looming CO2 uh, emission regulations on the horizon. Turns out that that was a pretty good decision if you just look at the cost of natural gas. At the time, we didn't anticipate that there would be fracking, which would be a game changer for natural gas, but the cost of fuel at those plants is much lower than we analyzed back then, but nonetheless, there were <coughs> inklings of that happening in the future. We were able to meet a lot of objectives by converting these plants, upgrading them. They'll be a significant part of our future going, or part of our future, uh, and they'll serve us well, well into the future as the result. But nonetheless, it was a billion dollar effort and so it had a big impact on customer rates. Uh, once you put that much infrastructure in place, somebody's got to pay the mortgage, and uh, that is up to our customers. So that, that's what we did. And you'll hear in the news as we talk about um, how to comply with the carbon regulations that are being proposed by the uh, by EPA that the utility was an earlier adopter and we're a little bit concerned that we didn't get credit for some of these uh, sort of uh, changes to our system that we proactively engaged in uh, when the, the EPA developed their rules. And so we'll be trying to convince people that, hey, we ought to get credit for what we did, when, even though it was before the rest of you decided to get serious about the issue. Coal, um, we've retired coal at Riverside, we've retired coal at Black Dog, a couple of small coal-fired power plants, one in Rib, uh, Red Wing, we converted to burn waste from the Twin Cities, coal-fired power plant in Mankato, we converted to burn waste from the Twin Cities, Coal-fired power plant in La Crosse, we converted to burn waste from La Crosse County. Um, Black Dog, we retired two units at Black Dog at, in the early 2000s, converted it to natural gas. And we're retiring the remaining two units that burn coal at Black Dog next year. So we've made substantial conversions to our system that people tend to forget about uh, when they start talking about, what have you done for me lately? What's next? So please keep that in mind. We've made major uh, changes to our system over the last decade or two. Uh, but what's left is our Circle power plant uh, and the King power plant out on the Stillwater. And so now the question with new regulations being proposed by the federal government, great deal of interest in the climate change issue and how to reduce CO2 emissions. Um, a lot of people say we need to make further reductions in our coal fleet. Um, we've got these three units, biggest power plant complex in the upper Midwest. Um, the first two units, each of them are 750 megawatts in size, so they're huge. Uh, but they're, they're over 30 years old, 35 years old. And so it's time to start figuring out what should the future of these units be. Should we invest in them to keep them running? There's no indication that they, they can't. Uh, we have to estimate what the capital maintenance program for these ought to be over time or will end up being over time 
but all indications are because of the economies of scale associated with plants like this, uh, these can continue to be the workhorses of the system from an economics point of view. Uh, there are regulations on the horizon, uh, both with regard to particulate matter coming out of these power plants. Uh, do they create or contribute to regional haze the, around the system uh, is one set of questions. Uh, and then how best do we reduce the CO2 coming out of our system uh, to reflect uh, current public policy or developing public policy around climate change. Uh, and so that's going to be a big issue in our resource planning over the next five years or so. A lot of people in the environmental community say, shut those down. Uh, find a different way. Uh, replace them with the combination of uh, renewable energy, conservation, and if you've got to add some additional dispatchable generation, uh, add natural gas, uh, but not much. Uh, reflects a lot of sentiment around the nation, and it reflects what's coming at us in the public policy arena. And so that's a serious issue that we have to think hard about. Uh, but on the flip side of it, we've got our business and industrial customers who use lots of electricity and say, do the right thing, but keep the cost of electricity manageable. Keep it low. Uh, are we really going to have an impact on global CO2 concentrations by changing the output from one of these plants? Or is it going to take an entire society? You know, some really interesting public policy debates around all of this that uh, anybody who produces electricity finds themselves in the middle of. So that's the question. We're, we're looking at that. Part of our resource planning is to show our regulators what their choices are. Yeah, we can shut them down, but here's the implications of doing that. Yeah, we can add more renewables to the system, but here's the implication of doing that. Uh, so that we can have a good public policy debate with our regulators so that we can pick the best course and a course that everybody can support. Oh, I, natural gas. Natural gas is the most economical dispatchable power plant addition to our system. Um, we have, and there's been a game changer, then that was the whole way in which natural gas is extracted from the ground. Uh, hydraulic fracturing, fracking for short. Uh, just amazing technology where they can directionally drill for a mile or more into the ground, uh, inject a fluid of some sort that breaks up the rock and that causes that natural gas then to, to uh, be extracted from those tight rocks. And so we've got a lot more gas available to us nationally. And as the result of that, the price of natural gas has changed drastically over time, as you can see. Over $12 back in the 2008 uh, and falling to the 3 or $4 range today. And with those kinds of economics, uh, coal can't compete. So we're looking at natural gas additions into the foreseeable future as the fossil fuel that competes with all these other types of power plants. And a natural gas power plant, by the way, uh, produces or emits about half the CO2 that a coal-fired power plant does. Well, there is a regulatory process that I've, I've alluded to a couple of times uh, associated with all of this. We are a regulated utility, uh, uh, and as the result, we have to uh, work with our public utility commission uh, to sort out questions of what's the best thing to do for our customers. Uh, and we present our resource plans to them every couple of years. <coughs> Excuse me. There's uh, 
lengthy process that goes with that where any member of the public and all of our stakeholders have the opportunity to look at our plans and provide their perspective and through a, an exchange of comments and a debate before our Public Utility Commission, uh, that commission either accepts our plans and they can modify them or they can say, nah, you're, you're headed in the wrong direction, do something else. We'll be filing our next resource plan with our Public Utility Commission here come January <coughs> and over the 2014 and into 2000, oops, I'm behind, in, there it is, sorry, uh, through 15 and into 16 then we will be going through that regulatory process to take a look at our plans. That's what I had for you. Do we have time for a few questions? Jim, Randy, Royce, uh, I got a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is pretty basic, but in order to get our head around the usage, how many homes does a megawatt serve, as an example? Um, and then the second question I have revolves around nuclear power. Um, I'm reading some information that says that we're starting to re revisit nuclear power, but as an alternative energy because of the uh, increased uh, safety that is being uh, put together in the new uh, power plant structures. And if that's the case, what impact is that going to have on itself? Oh, great questions. Um, <laughs> Megawatt serves about 800 to 1,000 customers. Um, nuclear power. That's residential customers, by the way. Uh, you stop and think about an industrial load. The major refinery here in the Twin Cities uh, demands about 100 megawatts. IDS building, the load there is about 10 megawatts. Um, so just to give you some feel uh, for what various uses in our community consume. Um, <clears throat> nuclear power, I just saw an item this, in this morning's news where Seattle City and Light says that they're going to commit to new modular nuclear power to meet their needs out in the 10 to 15 year time frame. There's a lot of development going on to build 200 to 500 megawatt uh, cookie cutter nuclear power plants that you can build anywhere without changing the design of the innards of the plant. And, and the industry, the nuclear, you know, GE and Westinghouse and, and the nuclear industry have been working with our federal regulators, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, to license that kind of power plant so that it, it's more modular and can be added to a, a, a system and has internal safety controls that, uh, <clears throat> of a nature that reduce the safety concerns at the plant. But that's kind of an emerging story. It's not something that's out there in the five to ten year time frame. It's out there a little bit further, probably. As soon as I say that, I'll be proven wrong after I retire and just watch, but that's the thinking anyway now. Um, <clears throat> nuclear power today, if you look to the southeast, there are about five utilities that are building power plant additions similar in design to those that are currently out there, and they're experiencing huge cost overruns. Um, there, I forget which utility is which, but they went into a project assuming a three or four billion dollar power plant, and they're currently up to six or seven billion dollars. Uh, and so the one of a kind major 11 or 1200 megawatt power plant addition uh, just doesn't look like it's gonna be economical anymore and indeed that's why the industry has gone to the more modular approach and so I, I think it's a real option that people are gonna have to look at as we start facing some of those nuclear decisions I talked about earlier yeah yeah I, I was really surprised to see that it was 3.4 million customers I think that was the number from the earlier that's XL energy wide 
Yes, but that, that's a mix of both industrial, business, and residential. Could you break that up a little bit? Would you be able to? Okay, now that's, that's across all four systems. We're about 1.6, 1.7 here in the upper Midwest. And I don't have a breakdown, but I can find it for you. Yeah, be glad to dig it out. Yeah. Michelle, would you remind me? Thanks. Well, we are out of time. I want to be respectful to everyone here. Um, Jim, can you stick around? Because I know there are a few more people that have some questions. Sure, so sure. if you could well, stick I'm, around. I'll be the last one out. Great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone, let's give uh, Jim a round. Thank you. Thank you.